There was a king's minister who came to see the Buddha one time and offered his definition of a wise person. Someone who was learned, who was mindful, who had understand what was being said to him, and was skilled in the affairs of the world. In other words, the minister was describing himself a very worldly definition of wisdom. And he asked the Buddha, do you want to praise my definition or do you want to criticize it? And the Buddha said, neither. But he offered another definition. Four qualities that make you wise. One is that you work for the welfare of many people. Another is that you can get the mind in the jhana whenever you want. The third is that you have control over the ways of the mind. In other words, you think whatever thoughts you want to think, and you don't have to think the thoughts you don't want to think. You can will the resolves you want to will, and you don't will the resolves you don't. And then finally, you've eradicated the affluence. So in this case, of course, the Buddha was describing himself. It's a very high standard for discernment wisdom. But we can learn some lessons from it, whatever level we're on in our own practice. One is that wisdom is practical. In no case does the Buddha talk about wisdom being a body of knowledge in the abstract. It's mainly skills. Plus a set of values that you want to make sure that your, your actions are not only for your own welfare, but for the welfare of as many people as you can think. Now, it's wise, of course, in the sense that if you're acting for the welfare of other people, they're not going to try to destroy your happiness. You've got some goodness inside, and you're happy to share it. And that makes you more safe. As for the ability to control the ways of the mind and to get the mind in jhana, those both come from two very simple principles. One is the realization that the mind needs to be trained. You can't just sit there and watch it coming and going thinking this, thinking that, and then thinking that wisdom lies in just allowing the mind to do whatever it's going to do and not get upset about it. We're here to train the mind, which means that every time you're able to say no to an unskillful urge, unskillful thought, you're doing something wise. But of course, you want to be able to develop that as a skill. Because if you say no, and you simply drive it underground in a way where it's going to come back out again, that's not yet wise. To really control your mind, you want to be able to say no in a way that's really effective. That's what requires wisdom. It's not just force or just restraint. The wisdom lies in getting the mind on your side, or the obstreperous voices of the mind on your side, by pointing out to them that we all want happiness. Every member of the Committee of the Mind wants happiness. Simply we have different ideas about what it means, what it would be, how to go about it. But if you can show the impatient members of the Committee that there is a well-being that can come right here in the present moment, being on the path, they're more likely to want to listen and to get on board. This is why the control of the mind, in other words, thinking about thoughts you want to think and not thinking the ones you don't want to think, has to go together with the ability to get the mind into a state where it does feel a sense of rapture, it does feel a sense of well-being.
to provide the mind with an alternative pleasure. The Buddha himself said as much that jhana is wise in the practice, in the sense that you may know in the abstract the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, drawbacks of sensuality. But if you don't have an alternative pleasure, you're going to go back to your old sensual thoughts. So you cut off your sensual thoughts with the contemplation of the body. Go through the different parts. Ask yourself, which part of the body, taken on its own, would you like to lie down with at night? A pile of skin, a couple of intestines. There's really nothing in there that is really that attractive. And yet, when it's all put together and sewn up, made up, clothed, then it starts getting attractive. What's going on? Where is, are the perceptions of the mind playing tricks on you? You want to come from understanding so that you do have control over thinking the thoughts you want to think and not having to think the thoughts you don't want to think. In other words, thinking thoughts that are going to be for your long-term welfare and happiness. Willing things that will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. The wisdom lies, as I said, in psyching out the mind getting it on your side, so you're not constantly battling over these things. And the fact that, as I said, all the committee members want happiness gives you your opening into them to show them this is a much better happiness. Get the mind to settle down. Breathe in a way that feels good inside. Spread that sense of good breath around. And you can provide the mind with an immediate pleasure so that the impatient members are happy to settle in. As for the members that want entertainment, you can play with the breath in lots of ways. Or you can entertain yourself with body contemplation. As I said, think of various ways in which you can drive home the point that the parts of the body are really not all that attractive. Use your ingenuity. This is why the control of the mind is wise. Because on the one hand, it's wise both in the sense that it requires wisdom to do it, strategic wisdom. It also protects you from doing all kinds of unskillful things. And then finally, the, the knowledge it puts in into defilements. That basically is the Four Noble Truths. And remember, the four truths are not simply four interesting truths about suffering. They're sorting boxes, categories. Something comes up in the mind, you can ask yourself, is this stress or is this the cause of stress? In other words, is this clinging or is it craving? They can sometimes be very similar. But the duty with each is different. If it's craving, you abandon it. If it's clinging, you've got to comprehend it. The best first step is to assume that it's clinging. Try to comprehend what's going on. Then you get so that when you really understand, you can say, oh, well, these acts of mine are clinging and these ones are craving. You know what to abandon. It's like coming into your house and the house is flooded with water. If you just try to bail out the water, it's, you're never going to come to an end of it. But if you find where the broken pipe is, then you seal off the broken pipe, and that's the end of the problem.
But to get to the pipe, you have to wade through the water. So you're going to be wading through a lot of stuff, a lot of suffering before you find the cause. This is why we have to have concentration. Again, this is why concentration is a wise thing to be doing. It gives you a foundation so that you're not feeling threatened by whatever stress, suffering there is in the mind. You find that at least one part of the mind is not stressed out, it's not suffering. So you focus your attention there. Take that as your foundation. And then from that foundation you can watch the suffering, watch the stress, watch the clinging. And you can begin to sort out where is the clinging, where is the craving. You found the pipe. Now you can seal it off. That's what the Buddha tells us, the Four Noble Truths too. The categories for assigning duties. So you learn to use them in that way. And even if you don't get all the way to the ending of the affluence, at least you've got the mind in the right problem-solving mode, because that's what the Four Noble Truths are. You've got the problem of suffering, and you know that where there's a problem, there's got to be a cause. And if you're going to solve the problem, you've got to solve it at the cause. You don't solve it at the result. And then you do what needs to be done to solve it at the cause. You got the Four Noble Truths right there. So wisdom is a matter of solving problems. The king's minister coming to the Buddha was thinking mainly in terms of problems of the world. The Buddha was thinking more of problems inside the mind. You work for the benefit of the world. This doesn't mean you ignore your own benefit. As he said, the most praiseworthy people are the ones who work for their own benefit and for the benefit of others. Second down are those who work for their own benefit, even if it's not for the benefit of others. Third down, those who work for the benefit of others, but not for themselves. An interesting ranking. They would have said your primary responsibility is to yourself, but you move beyond that. And it opens up the mind. The times when you're sitting here meditating and you're wondering, here I am just taking care of my little self when all these big problems are out there in the world. And then you remember, what does the world need most? It means people who got their minds trained. And when you've got your mind trained, then you have more to offer others. And you offer it in a way that's impressive, because you're, they're not you're not just offering them words or ideas. You're trying to embody what you've taught. And the sense that you're doing this not just for yourself, that is uplifting. So in all these cases, wisdom is strategic. It's not simply a series of little statements. You know, we've seen those books of wisdom, the wisdom of Lao Tzu, the wisdom of whoever, just page after page of wise statements. That's not what wisdom is. It's seeing a problem and knowing how to solve it, sometimes seeing a problem that nobody else saw, but solving it. The king's minister didn't see the problems that the Buddha saw. Which is why his definition of wisdom, even though it would work for the world, was not nearly as penetrating as the Buddha's. The Buddha saw that the big problems are inside, so you've got to solve them inside. And the first step is realizing you've got to train the mind. And the second step is realizing you're doing this not only for yourself. You work on those two principles and all the ramifications of wisdom will get worked out.
both for your own benefit and for the benefit of those around you.